In this Baldur's Gate 3 multi-classing guide, we're going to take a look at monk multi-classing. This is the fourth video in our series where we sort of go through the ins and outs of multi-classing one specific class with all other classes in the game, kind of going through the breakpoints, like what the pros and cons are of multi-classing at each breakpoint. Of course, while we're doing this, we're keeping in mind that you will be predominantly a monk in this case. We're not going to be taking a look at like dipping one or two levels into monk compared to other classes. But those will be covered in the other class videos while you might take one or two levels of monk compared to that other class. Monk is a very interesting class in my opinion and it's one of the more unique classes in Baldur's Gate 3 and it's one that can be challenging to multi-class and that's because of its key resource. Key is a resource that monks have that allow them to use Step of the Wind, that allow them to use Patient Defense, that allow them to use Flurry of Blows. And they need this resource in order to use this, and they gain it back on every short or long rest. But they only gain this resource from taking monk levels. So it kind of behooves monks to take many levels in monk in order to gain a good amount of this resource. Otherwise, a lot of what makes a monk a monk is kind of, kind of wasted. Now the good news is, though, that this resource is regained on short rest. So you only need enough key to get you through a combat if you typically short rest in between combats. So you can get away with like six or seven key a lot of the time. And, you know, having more than that is good, obviously, if you're a monk. But you don't necessarily have to have all your levels of monk because of that if you're going to plan on short resting in between combats. So first, let's take a look at Barbarian Monk Multiclassing. This is a phenomenal pairing, in my opinion, because Rage really benefits unarmed attacks. Getting that Rage extra Rage damage to each unarmed strike that you do with Flurry of Blows or regular unarmed attacks can really boost the damage of a monk, which is great. Also getting the damage resistance is good, since monks tend to be squishy. And if you're playing like an unarmored monk, obviously you can benefit from the constitution passive of barbarians increasing their armor class, whether you have wisdom or not. Obviously these don't stack, so you know, you're know you not going to be able to crank wisdom and constitution and get armor class from both. But maybe you don't want wisdom on your monk, but you still want to get that extra armor class. This is a good pairing. So first up, let's take a look at 10 Monk to Barbarian, and I think this is probably the least amount of Barbarian levels you would take. This will give you access to Rage, and it'll give you access to Reckless Attack. Keep in mind that Reckless Attack does not work with Unarmed Attacks, so if you're planning on taking advantage of Reckless Attack, then you will probably want to use some sort of melee weapon, you know, in order to, to take best advantage of that if possible. Otherwise, don't really factor in Reckless Attack. Yeah, and what you're going to lose from going down from 12 monk to 10 monk uh, is basically your third feat, and you're going to lose a subclass feature. And which subclass feature you lose is really dependent on, you know, what subclass you're choosing. So it, your mileage is going to vary there a little bit. But I think generally speaking, this is probably a decent trade-off if you're planning on playing a monk that's not predominantly using unarmed attacks. You might be better off going like 11 monk in one barbarian if you're not really, you know, going to need reckless attack. At 9 Monk 3 Barbarian, you're going to gain a Barbarian subclass, which is phenomenal. There are some really good subclasses for Barbarian. You can gain some very good things here. But you will lose Improved Unarmored Movement and Purity of Body. These are not that important in my opinion. You do already have pretty good Unarmored Movement if you're playing a Monk with no Armor or Shield. So, you know, this isn't huge loss in my opinion. And Purity of Body is good, but it's not great. Picking up that Barbarian subclass is probably better in the long run. So I think 9 and 3 is a better breakpoint than 10 and 2 generally. So then if you go to 8 Monk 4 Barbarian, you're going to gain your third feat back, but you will lose advanced unarmored movement and you will lose some unarmed damage. I don't think this is a great trade in my opinion, particularly if you're playing an unarmed monk. If you're playing like a, you know, monk barbarian that's actually using armor, then this is probably not a big deal. Especially one that's using a weapon, then this is probably a better trade. But if you're planning on playing like, unarmored and unarmed then this is definitely not a good trade for you so then at level seven monk five barbarian you're going to gain fast movement and an extra attack from barbarian which does not stack with the extra attack of monk so you're basically just gaining fast movement and you're losing out on that third feat in exchange for that this is not a good trade you do not want to be seven monk five barbarian you'd be better off being eight and four or nine and three or even six and six would be better than seven and five and then at 6 Monk, 6 Barbarian, you're going to pick up a Barbarian subclass feature and a Rage Charge in exchange for losing Evasion, which is going to help protect you from spells a little bit and Stillness of Mind. And I think this is probably a good trade-off for the most part. It's kind of a wash. Like, you're gaining some good things, but you're also losing some good things. 
in general, it's probably a trade-off unless you have a very specific build in mind. So in my opinion, you know, you're probably better off going like nine and three, eight and four, or six and six, with nine and three probably being the strongest breakpoint. So then we move on to Bard Monk multi-classing, and this is an interesting one in my opinion. There are a lot of advantages to picking up Bard as a monk, and some of them probably don't seem quite as obvious, but because monks regain their key on short rests and bards gain song of rest, that can be really beneficial for them, allowing them to, you know, rest again and replenish those in between long rests. And also because they're bardic inspiration, they can use that as a bonus action. And once they hit level five as a bard, they can use that or replenish those on short rest as well. Getting at least five levels of bard can make a lot of sense with a monk bard multi-class because you're going to be able to get back your Bardic Inspiration and your key every time you short rest, and you'll be able to short rest in extra time. So starting at level 10 Monk and taking two of Bard, I don't think you would take one level of Bard in my opinion, because getting that Song of Rest is important. You're going to gain level 1 Bard spells and spell slots. Song of Rest, as I already mentioned, you'll gain Jack of All Trades, which will give you some you know, skill checks if you need them. In exchange for this, you're going to lose a feat in a subclass feature. I think this is probably a pretty good trade-off. It's like probably a wash. So you could probably just go 12 Monk um, if you want to be about the same effectiveness as 10 Monk and 2 Bard. A little bit more utility on the 10 Monk, 2 Bard, but probably want to take some more Bard classes to really get the most out of this. And one thing I want to mention before we get too much further is that Bards use Charisma for their spellcasting ability modifier, while Monks use Wisdom for theirs if they went Way of the Four Elements. So there is a bit of a conflict there if you're planning on playing a Way of Four Elements Monk. However, I would suggest that, you know, you either just don't take Bard spells that are hostile so that they don't really depend on Charisma to cast, or you don't play Way of the Four Elements Monk and you just focus on Charisma. That way, you know, you don't have to spread your stats around as much. And then at 9 Monk and 3 Bard, you gain a Bard subclass, you gain Expertise and 2 Skills, and you gain level 2 Bard spells and spell slots. For losing improved on our movement and purity of body. This is a fantastic trade-off in my opinion. You'll gain, you know, proficiencies here if you go College of Swords or College of Valor. You'll gain some more skills and you'll gain uh, Cutting Words here if you go College of Lore. There's just a lot of good pickup at 9 Monk and 3 Bard. And I think if I was going to go 9 Monk, and th or if I was going to go Monk and Bard, I would go at least 9 Monk and 3 Bard. I don't think 10 and 2 is as good. So then at 8 Monk 4 Bard, you're going to gain a feat and a Bard cantrip in exchange for losing advanced unarmored movement and losing some damage on your unarmed attacks. If you're not planning on playing like predominantly an unarmed monk, like if you plan on using a weapon of some kind, uh, particularly if you want like College of Swords or something like that, then I think this is probably a decent trade-off. But if you're planning on playing an unarmed monk, then you definitely don't want to stop at this breakpoint. Unless you use that feat to pick up something like Tavern Brawler or something like that, which would you know, essentially offset that. At 7 Monk and 5 Bard, you gain Font of Inspiration, Improved Bardic Inspiration, improving that die from 1d6 to 1d8, and you're going to gain level 3 Bard spells and spell slots in exchange for losing that feat. That is a phenomenal trade-off in my opinion. As I mentioned earlier, this allows you to use your Bardic Inspiration on short rest. And if you went like College of Swords or something that allows you to use these like special attacks that you can use your Bardic Inspiration die for that are now stronger. And you're also going to have level 3 spells, which is great. So I think 7 and 5 is definitely better than 8 and 4 generally. And then at 6 Monk and 6 Bard, you gain Counter Charm and you also gain Bard subclass features. This would be extra attack if you're playing Swords or Valor. And it would be extra magical secrets if you're playing College of Lore. And in exchange, you lose Evasion and Stillness of Mind. I think this is probably only worth it if you're playing College of Lore, in my opinion, because that extra attack that you gain for Swords and Valor does not stack with the Monks. So you're effectively only gaining Counter Charm here. Well, as if you're playing College of Lore, you'll actually gain that extra magical secrets for those extra spells. So I think there is a case here if you're playing College of Lore, but otherwise, 7 and 5 is probably better for if you're playing the either of the other two. So next up, we take a look at Monk Cleric Multiclassing, and there's a lot to love here with this multi-class. Clerics use Wisdom for their spellcasting ability modifier, just like Way of the Four Elements Monks do, and obviously Monks in Extra Armor class went on Armored for each point of Wisdom, so there is some synergy there as well. Definitely more synergy, you know, than some other classes that don't use Wisdom for their spellcasting, so this is not a bad pairing. So first, we'll take a look at 11 Monk 1 Cleric, and essentially what you're doing here is you're saying, I'm going to lose my third feat, and I'm going to pick up Cleric Level 1 Spells and Spell Slots. You're going to pick a Cleric Domain and gain access to some Domain Spells, depending on which Domain you chose. 
you're going to gain some proficiencies in some cases, depending on which domain you chose. So there's a lot to love here for one level of cleric. And I think probably the most likely reason that you would do this is if you were trying to pick up some easy proficiencies. And, you know, this level one of cleric is a great way to do that. This means you would probably go something like war or tempest or even life domain, something like that in order to pick up you know, heavy armor proficiency and maybe some weapon proficiencies. And then at 10 monk to cleric, you're going to gain your channel divinity ability for your cleric, you know, whatever, depending on which domain you chose. So your mileage is going to vary depending on which one you chose a little bit in exchange for losing a subclass feature of the monk. And again, this one is kind of a trade off depending on what subclass you went, and what build you're picking. It's kind of a wash, so I don't think you're going to get much out of this generally at 10 and 2 compared to 11 and 1, depending on, unless you have a very specific build in mind with some very specific setup that benefits specifically. Otherwise, you know, 11 and 1 is probably better than 10 and 2. And then at 9 monk, 3 cleric, you're going to gain access to cleric level 2 spells and spell slots as well as the domain spells, the second level of domain spells for that domain in exchange for losing improved unarmored movement and purity of body. This is a good trade-off in my opinion. I think if you're going to go past 11 and 1 cleric, or 11 monk and 1 cleric, 9 and 3 is definitely better than 10 and 2. I would at least go that far, if not further. And then at 8 monk, 4 cleric, you're going to gain a feat in a cleric cantrip in exchange for losing advanced unarmored movement and some unarmored damage, or unarmed damage, I should say. And again, this is another one where like, if you're playing an unarmed monk, unless you're taking tavern brawler with this feat, you definitely don't want to take this. If you're playing a weapon-based cleric monk, then it's probably a good trade-off. And then at 7 monk 5 cleric, you gain access to level 3 cleric spells and spell slots, as well as the domain spells of that cleric, as well as destroy undead in exchange for losing a feat. This is really good in my opinion, again, particularly if you're not playing an unarmed monk, um, simply because you can gain some very deadly spells here. Like if you went like light cleric, you can gain fireball here. There's a lot of really good spells at this level, depending on your domain. And, you know, getting those in exchange for losing a feat is a good pickup, I think. Really depends on what you're going for, obviously, with your Cleric Monk build. But I think generally, more often than not, it'll be a good trade. And then lastly, we have 6 Monk, 6 Cleric. And here you're going to gain another Channel Divinity Charge and a subclass feature. The mileage is going to vary depending on what subclass you choose in exchange for losing evasion and stillness of mind. This is probably a wash more often than it's not, meaning like you could go either way, depending on what subclass you chose for cleric, like, you know, what you're going to lose here. I think this is probably, you know, could go either way, depending on how you're set up, just taking a look at the subclasses features that you're gaining. So next we'll take a look at druid monk multi-classing. And this is another one that has some decent synergy because druids and monks both use wisdom for their spell casting if you're going way of the four elements. And again, with monks having, you know, unarmored monks getting a benefit from wisdom being added to their armor class if you're playing unarmored, this can have nice synergy. But also keep in mind that Circle of the Moon Druid, as I've mentioned in previous videos, does not lend itself well to multi-classing. So when we're talking about multi-classing monk druid, we're predominantly talking about multi-classing with Circle of the Land or Circle of the Spores, not really including Circle of the Moon Druid. So at 10 monk, true druid, which is I think the highest level you'd go of monk, you're going to gain druid level 1 spells and spell slots. You're going to gain access to wild shape, though I don't know that you would use it much. And you're going to gain a druid subclass. And in exchange, you will lose a feat and a subclass feature of monk. This is probably a wash. Again, like I, you could go 12 monk and 0 druid and probably be about as effective as 10 monk, 2 druid at this point. You'd have more utility as a druid. Um, but you're not necessarily going to be more effective. So it's kind of a wash at this point, even though you do pick up some nice things from Druid. At 9 Monk, 3 Druid, you gain access to Druid level 2 spells and slots, as well as a Druid subclass feature. These are specific spells. If you're Circle of the Spores Druid, if you're Circle of the Land, you get to choose two spells. In exchange, you will also gain a natural recovery charge if you are a Circle of the Land. And you're going to lose improved unarmored movement and purity of body. This is a good trade-off in my opinion. And much like some of the other multi-classes I've already mentioned, I think I would go at least 9 and 3 if I was going to dip into Druid. I don't think I would go lower than that. And then at 8 monk 4 Druid, you gain a feat and Druid cantrip, but lose advanced unarmored movement and you lose out on unarmed damage. And again, as I mentioned in previous ones, unless you're taking Tavern Brawler here, um, you definitely don't want to take this or go down this far unless you're going further 
if you're playing an unarmed druid monk. Otherwise, if you're playing a weapon-based one, like one that uses like shillelagh or something like that with a club, then, you know, this would be a fine trade. And then we go to 7 Monk 5 Druid. Here you gain Wild Strikes, which really isn't going to benefit you much because you're not really going to be Wild Shaping much if you're playing a Monk Druid. You're going to gain level 3 Druid spells and slots, which is great, and you're going to gain access to, you know, specific spells if you're Circle of the Spores Druid, and you're getting the pick from spells if you're Circle of the Land, and also gain Natural Recovery Charge if you're Circle of Land. So this is a great level in exchange for losing a feat. Definitely worth it, in my opinion, if you're going to go Druid Monk. 7 and 5 is probably, I would either go 9 and 3 or 7 and 5. I think 8 and 4 is okay, but 7 and 5 is probably better. And then finally we come to 6 Monk and 6 Druid. Here you'll gain a Druid subclass feature and you'll lose Evasion and Stillness of Mind. And the subclass feature you gain at Circle of the Land is just, you basically don't get slowed down by difficult terrain. And for Circle of Spores, you actually pick up a decent subclass feature at this level, so... I would only consider going 6 Monk and 6 Druid if I was going to go Circle of Spores Druid. Otherwise, I would stay at 7 and 5 if I was going Circle of the Land. So next we come to Multiclassing with Fighter. And obviously there's a lot to love here with Multiclassing, Monk, and Fighter. There are a lot of things you can benefit from from Fighter like Armor and Weapon Proficiencies, Fighting Style, Action Surge. All of these things are phenomenal for a Monk. So let's get into you know exactly what the breakpoints might be and why you might breakpoint at specific places. So the highest you would go here is 11 Monk and 1 Fighter, and that would be simply to gain access to the armor and weapon proficiencies of Fighter. Um, you might consider taking the level of Fighter first to gain heavy armor proficiency if you want it. Also, you can gain a fighting style here. Keep in mind that unless you're using a weapon with the Monk, that really probably the best fighting style for you is just going to be defense to gain an extra armor class. But if you are using a weapon, you know, you could take great weapon fighting, or you could take, you know, any other one really, dueling, something like that. And you also gain Second Wind here, which, you know, is a mild heal as a bonus action that's probably going to get worse over time, but it would still be good to have. And in exchange for that, you lose a feat. I think this is worth the trade, in my opinion, considering all the armor, weapon proficiencies, and fighting style that you would gain. Definitely think it is worth that trade. So talking 10 Monk, 2 Fighter, you're going to gain Action Surge, which is going to allow you to attack, you know, with your action a second time in combat and you're going to lose a subclass feature for that. This is definitely worth it, in my opinion. Um, keep in mind that, you know, if you're going to take two levels of fighter, you know, to get Action Surge, Action Surge is going to be a lot more beneficial after you have extra attack from Monk. So you might want to go, like, five levels of Monk and two levels of fighter, or one level of fighter, five levels of Monk, and then another level of fighter, something like that. Because that, you know, when you attack and then get your extra attack, then use Action Surge, you'll get to attack and get your extra attack again, resulting in four attacks. That's much better than just the two attacks you could do. But keep in mind that, you know, Action Surge allows you to use something else with your action. It doesn't necessarily have to be an attack. So if you're playing like Way of Four Elements, you could cast a spell, for instance, with one action and then attack again with another action and get your extra attack. Something like that. And then we come to Nine Monk Three Fighter. Here you're going to gain a fighter subclass and you're going to lose improved unarmored movement and purity of body. I think this is a good trade in my opinion. I think this is even better than Ten and Two because there's a lot to love at fighter subclasses. Whether you're a battle master picking up some superiority die, which can replenish on short rest, just like Monk's Key, that's a really good pickup. Or maybe you want to get some spells from Eldritch Knight, or you know, maybe you just want to be a champion for you know better critical chance. All these things are are good in my opinion, and I definitely think if you're planning on going at least ten and two, you might consider going nine and three. And then at eight Monk Four Fighter, you're going to gain your third feat back, but you're going to lose advanced unarmored movement, and you're going to lose some unarmed damage, and as I've been saying, this is probably fine. It's like probably a wash in terms of a trade-off here. Um, it's obviously going to be less beneficial to you if you're playing an unarmed monk unless you take Tavern Brawler with that feat. Otherwise, you know, it's really a wash. And then at 7 monk, 5 fighter, you're going to gain a fighter's extra attack, which does not stack with a monk, so that's effectively nothing, and you're going to lose a feat. So you don't want to go 7 monk, 5 fighter. You'd be better off going 8 and monk, 4 fighter, or 6 monk and 6 fighter, but you don't want to go 7 monk, 5 fighter. And then at 6 monk, 6 fighter, you're going to gain a feat, because fighters gain an extra feat at this level, and you'll lose evasion and stillness of mind. This is probably a good trade, in my opinion. Um, I don't know if I would go all the way down to 6 monk and 6 fighter just for this, because I feel like it's, you know, kind of a wash a little bit. The feat might come out a little bit better generally, but you have to go through basically a whole level where you don't get that anyway, and you could gain that same feat at 8 Monk and 4 Fighter, 
So I think generally speaking, nine and three is probably the sweet spot here. But if you really want to have that third feed going eight monk, four fighter is all right. And next we come to Paladin Monk multi-classing. And this would definitely be a better multi-class if it weren't for the fact that Divine Smite does not work when unarmed, meaning that you're going to have to play a Monk Paladin that uses a weapon to get the most out of Divine Smite, or you won't be able to use it. And also, Paladin spells, you know, scale with Charisma, while Monks scale with Wisdom. This isn't too much of an issue, though, because unless you're using Monk spells, you won't really need a ton of Wisdom anyway. So first, let's take a look at 10 Monk, 2 Paladin. If you take this setup, you're going to gain weapon and armor proficiencies that you might want for your Monk. Keep in mind that a lot of Monk things, uh, you know, require unarmored. So the armor proficiencies maybe not be as beneficial to you, although the weapon proficiencies might. Uh, you'll also gain a Paladin subclass, so you'll get some subclass features from that Paladin. You'll gain Divine Sense and Channel Oath from the, you know, subclass that you choose. You'll gain a Fighting Style, which is nice. You'll gain Divine Smite. Um, again, you'll have to use a weapon in order to get the most out of that. And you will gain some Paladin Spellcasting and Spell Slots in exchange for losing a feat and a subclass feature. That is a lot of things that you gain even at two levels. So if you are planning on playing a weapon-based Monk, Paladin, two levels of Paladin is not bad. So as you go down to 9 Monk and 3 Paladin, you'll gain some spells depending on you know what oath you took. And you'll also gain Divine Health. And you will lose improved armored movement and purity of body. This is probably a wash in my opinion. I don't think if I was going to go 9 Monk, or if I was going to go Monk Paladin, I would stop at 9-3. I would either go 10-2, or I would go much further down. And then at 8 Monk, 4 Paladin, you're going to gain a feat in exchange from losing advanced unarmored movement, and you will also lose some unarmed damage. Because you're not going to be playing really an unarmed Monk this way, I mean, you still will have Flurry of Blows that you can use. Um, this is not as much of a bad trade-off. This is probably fine because you're going to be using a weapon most of the time. And then at 7 Monk, 5 Paladin, you'll gain extra attack from Paladin that does not stack with the Monk's extra attack, so that's kind of wasted. But you will gain level 2 Paladin spells and spell slots and some more, you know, spells of that Oath, which is nice. Um, again, these spell slots can be used for Divine Smite, so this is a strong level for Paladin, and you will lose a feat. I don't think 7 and 5 is as good as 6 and 6 in my opinion because at 6 Paladin you'll actually gain Aura of Protection in exchange for losing Evasion and Stillness of Mind and Aura of Protection is extremely strong particularly if you have a decent amount of Charisma which you probably will have on this build because you probably won't be investing too much into Wisdom. Next we move to Ranger Monk and there's some good synergies here because Rangers and Monk both use... Uh, Wisdom for their spellcasting ability, so if you're planning on playing the Way of the Four Elements, Ranger is not a bad option, especially if you're planning to use some hostile Ranger spells. And, um, you know, there is that synergy with monks applying their Wisdom to their armor class if they're unarmored, which is great. You will also gain, you know, if you're taking Ranger, you'll gain some weapon proficiencies, which is nice, and you'll pick up some skills too. So at 11 Monk and 1 Ranger, you're going to gain some weapon and armor proficiencies. And again, you're probably going to play unarmored as a Monk, but you could use armor if you want. And you are going to gain a skill and you will gain Natural Explorer and Favorite Enemy, which typically give you some skills and other features in exchange for losing a feat. I think this is a pretty good trade generally, particularly if you want to use your Monk more effectively outside of combat. And then at 10 Monk, 2 Ranger, you're going to pick up a Fighting Style. You're going to gain some Ranger Spells and some Spell Slots in exchange for losing a Monk subclass feature. This is a pretty good pickup, in my opinion. Fighting Style is always good. Giving you some utility with Ranger is good. And I think this is probably a wash depending on what subclass feature you're losing. But I think generally it's probably better than not. And then at 9 Monk, 3 Ranger, you're going to gain a Ranger subclass, but you're going to lose Improved Unarmored Movement and Purity of Body. This is a good trade, in my opinion particularly if you're going with Hunter or if you're going with Gloomstalker. You're probably not going to multi-class a um, Beastmaster very much because Beastmasters really benefit from taking levels of Beastmaster in order to keep their animal companion strong. The, if they take other levels of other classes, their companion will cease gaining improvements that will make them fall off late game. So you're probably only going to take a subclass of Hunter or Gloomstalker in this case, and this is definitely a good trade because both of those subclasses are front-loaded very heavily. And then at 8 Monk 4 Ranger, you're going to gain a feat in exchange for losing advanced unarmored movement and for sacrificing some unarmed damage. And this is probably a good trade in most cases because if you're playing a Ranger, you're going to gain uh, fighting style. And unless you pick defense, you really, you know, are going to want to have picked something 
that is going to make you use a weapon usually. So I think sacrificing some unarmed damage in order to gain a feat is probably better than not here, unless you did take defense and you're planning on playing unarmed. And then at 7 Monk 5 Ranger, you're going to gain extra attack from the Ranger, which doesn't stack, so that's kind of wasted, and you're going to gain Ranger level 2 spells and slots in exchange for losing a feat. And this is kind of a toss-up in my opinion. There are some good Ranger level 2 spells, but unless you're kind of playing like a stealthy Ranger, it's not like the greatest or best trade ever, so this is probably a wash depending on exactly what you want to do, whether you need more utility or if that feat would be better for you. And then lastly, at 6 Monk and 6 Ranger, you're going to gain another favored enemy, Natural Explorer, in exchange for losing Evasion and Stillness of Mind. This isn't a great trade, in my opinion. I don't recommend doing this. You could. It's probably, you know, okay in some situations. But generally speaking, you're probably going to want to stick with, like, 8 Monk and 4 Ranger. That's probably the sweet spot for that. I don't think 7 and 5 is all that great unless you want level 2 spells. But 6 and 6, there really isn't any reason to go that low. And then we come to Rogue Monk Multiclassing, and this is actually a pretty good multiclass. There's a big focus on dexterity for these two classes, because rogues need to use finesse weapons for their sneak attack damage. Um, this typically benefits dexterity, or dexterity can apply to this, rather, so there's a good reason there. They typically use light armor. Monks typically use no armor, so all their dexterity can usually apply to their armor class. Monks have deflect missiles, which is based off their dexterity, so, and obviously, you know, monks and rogues typically handle, like, the lock picking and trap disarming which typically falls under dexterity so there is a lot of synergy between these two classes particularly if you're playing like way of shadow monk that tends to be a bit stealthy anyway so at 11 monk one rogue you're going to gain sneak attack damage 1d6 and expertise in two skills in exchange for losing a feat this is probably a wash most of the time really depending on what you need the feat is probably better for most builds but unless you know exactly how you want your build to play you, you know, you're probably not going to come out ahead with sneak attack and expertise, but if you need the extra skills or you just want to be better and like handle like the lock picking slash sneaking of your group, one level rogue is not bad on monk. And then if you go 10 monk, 2 rogue, you're going to gain cunning action, allowing you to disengage, dash, and hide in combat as a bonus action in exchange for losing a subclass feature. This is really strong in my opinion, particularly if you're trying to play a stealthy monk. If you're not trying to play a stealthy monk so much, it's not as useful because you do have step of the wind uh, from monk which basically does the same thing anyway so this isn't super useful unless you're particularly trying to get that hide action then at nine monk three rogue you're going to gain a rogue subclass and you're going to gain extra sneak attack your sneak attack will go up to 2d6 in exchange for losing improved unarmored movement and purity of body this is a great trade again rogues are pretty front loaded at level three in most cases so you know like if you take uh, assassin, you know, that you're going to be better at leading off in combat. If you take Thief, you're going to gain an extra bonus action. So this is a really good level, in my opinion. And if you're going to go, you know, Monk Rogue, unless you're just dipping one level in Rogue in order to gain some skills, I think you definitely want to go at least 9 Monk 3 Rogue. And then if you go 8 Monk 4 Rogue, you're going to gain a feat in exchange for losing advanced unarmored movement and death strikes uh, is going to go down from D8 to D6, meaning your unarmed damage is going to go down a little bit. And keep in mind that rogues need to use a finesse weapon to do sneak attack. So they're going to have to use that for their normal attacks. But they will use flurry of blows a lot, particularly if they are a thief and have an extra bonus action. They can use this a lot in combat. So you may not want to lose out on that extra unarmed damage if you went thief, if you went assassin, or if you went um, arcane trickster. Maybe it's not as big of a deal to you. But if you definitely went thief, this is going to be kind of questionable for you. But it's not so bad of a trade-off if you went either of the other two subclasses. And then if you go 7 Monk, 5 Rogue, you gain Uncanny Dodge and you gain more Sneak Attack damage in exchange for losing a feat. Feats aren't super necessary for Monk Rogue multiclassing in my opinion. Like There's very few things that you're going to gain out of that because you have a lot of things you're going to be doing with your action and bonus action every turn. And you know getting that extra Sneak Attack damage might actually behoove you. Uncanny Dodge is pretty strong in my opinion. And usually you're probably going to spend most of your feats just increasing your dexterity to give you more armor class initiative and damage and hit chance. So you can max that out with two feats. So I think this is probably a better trade than not most of the time. And then at six monk, six rogue, you're going to gain expertise in two skills in exchange for losing evasion and stillness of mind. I don't think this is a great trade off in my opinion. You probably don't need expertise in four skills, but if for some reason you really want that expertise, you could do it. I think you're probably better off staying at seven monk and five rogue though. And if you really want, you could even go 5 Monk, 5 Rogue, and 2 Fighter in order to pick up Action Surge, Fighting Style, and some proficiencies as well.
So then we come to Sorcerer, Monk, Multiclassing, and this isn't the greatest pairing in my opinion for a couple reasons. First, Sorcerers use Charisma for their spellcasting, and if you're playing Way of the Four Elements Monk, then you're going to focus on Wisdom, and obviously if you want more Armor class, when well, you're unarmored, you'll be focusing on Wisdom. So there's a bit of a thing there, although you don't really need Wisdom on a Monk, so it's not the end of the world. However, because Sorcerers gain more Sorcery points, the higher level they go in Sorcerer, and Monks gain more Key, the higher level they go in Monk, the more you know, sorcery points you want, the less key you're going to have, and the more key you want to have, the less sorcery points you're going to have. So there's a little bit of conflict, you know, in these two classes because they both kind of want to put classes in their own class in order to give them more resources. So let's take a look at what you might do if you go 10 monk, 2 sorcerer. Here you would gain sorcerer level 1 spells and spell slots. You'd gain a sorcerer subclass. You would gain metamagic and some sorcery points, but you would lose a feat and a subclass feature. I'm not sure this is a great trade-off at this point because you just don't have a lot from Sorcerer going on. You have like the bare minimum of Sorcerer and it's going to give you a little bit of utility but it's not going to give you much. And then if you go 9 Monk, 3 Sorcerer, you're going to gain access to Sorcerer level 2 spells and slots. You're going to get to pick another meta magic like Quicken Spell which is great. You gain another Sorcery point and you'll lose some improved Unarmored Movement and Purity of Body. This is better in my opinion than 10 and 2. You at least have some stuff going for you for Sorcerer at this point and a lot more spell slots that you could make it justified in order to go Sorcerer for three levels. And then if you go 8 Monk 4 Sorcerer, you gain a feat and a cantrip, you lose advanced unarmed movement, and you lose some unarmed damage. You can play unarmed as a Monk Sorcerer and use Sorcerer spells to like give you buffs and stuff like that if you want in order to give you like Blur or you know other things like shield or you know even just to throw things out like magic missile or some hostile spells every now and then maybe like uh fireball or something as you get higher levels there are you know spells you can fling as a monk sorcerer but you could also use them defensively while you're fighting in melee combat so this is dependent on like how you're set up if you're planning on playing unarmed then i definitely you know would strongly consider not going down this low but if you're planning on playing you know, with a weapon or something like that predominantly, uh, then this is not a bad choice. And then if you go 7 Monk 5 Sorcerer, you gain level 3 Sorcerer spells and slots, you gain another Sorcery point and you lose a feat. This is probably okay in my opinion, depending on what feats you really want and how you're set up stat-wise. You don't need too many feats for this build. 3 is probably better than 2, but getting access to level 3 Sorcerer spells and spell slots is probably worth that trade most of the time. And then if you go 6 Monk, 6 Sorcerer, you're going to gain a Sorcerer subclass feature. These tend to be pretty strong in my opinion, and you'll lose Evasion and Stillness of Mind. You'll gain another Spell Slot, you'll gain another Sorcery Point, giving you 6 Sorcery Points at this level, allowing you to use Quicken Spell twice. And I think if I was going to go Sorcerer Monk, I would probably go 6 and 6 or 9 and 3. I think those are the two spots that I would probably stop and be predominantly a Monk with some, you know, Utility Sorcerer spells or be like a complete hybrid and you know use those sorcery spells when i need them and the rest of the time just be punching things in the face and next we come to warlock monk multi-classing and there is some synergy here because if you do go pack to the blade you're going to be able to get three attacks with your monk every turn if you're using a packed weapon or you know some weapon that you bound to yourself so not an unarmed monk in this case but a monk that uses a weapon you would be able to get three attacks which is quite strong so i think it's definitely a better pairing than maybe some of the other spell casting classes and you'd be able to cast spells that you gain back on short rest. And since you gain your key back on short rest as well, that synergizes a bit better in my opinion. So at 10 Monk, 2 Warlock, you're going to gain a Warlock subclass. You're going to gain 2 Warlock spell slots, 2 Eldritch Invocations in exchanging for losing a feat and a subclass feature. This is probably a toss-up, probably a little bit more to the Warlock side than going 12 Monk in my opinion. So you're probably going to want to go more levels in Warlock to really you know, get the benefit of multi-classing into Warlock than just 2. And then if you go 9 Monk, 3 Warlock, you're going to gain Warlock level 2 spells and slots. They're going to upgrade. You'll gain a Packed Boon, which will allow you to use Charisma for your attack modifier. So if you're playing Warlock Monk, you would probably not invest in Wisdom and you would invest in Charisma, particularly if you're going the you know Pact of the Blade route. And you would lose improved Unarmored Movement and Purity of Body to do this. This is a good trade in my opinion, so you definitely want to do that. And then 8 Monk and 4 Warlock gives you a feat and a cantrip, and you lose advanced unarmed movement, and you lose some unarmed damage. This is a good trade. Again, you're probably not going to be playing an unarmed Monk if you're playing this way. If, if you want to use Pact of the Blade, which is probably what you would be doing if you were playing combined with a Warlock. So that's fine. Again, you will still have Flurry of Blows that will go down a little bit in damage, but I think you'll come out ahead in damage by you know moving down to 7 Monk and 5 Warlock and gaining that extra attack from Warlocks, which does stack with Monks. 
So at 7 Monk, 5 Warlock, you're going to gain another Eldritch Invocation. You'll gain Warlock level 3 spells, and your spell slots will upgrade to Warlock level 3 spell slots. And you will gain that extra attack that does stack with the Monk's extra attack in exchange for losing a feat. That is a good trade, in my opinion. Being able to attack 3 turns every turn with a Monk is fantastic. And you can use Stunning Strike on all those as well, so you could potentially stun 3 targets. And then if you go 6 Monk, 6 Warlock, you will gain a Warlock subclass feature in exchange for losing Evasion and Stillness of Mind. This really depends on what the Warlock subclass feature is and what you really need and what subclass you took. This is probably a wash depending on what that is. So you could go 6 and 6, or you could go like 6, 5, and 1 level of Fighter to pick up some proficiencies and maybe, you know, uh, Fighting Style as well. And then lastly, we come to Wizard Monk multiclassing, and you would probably, in this case, you know, not invest too heavily in Wisdom because you're going to want to gain some intelligence um, in order to have your hostile Wizard spells connect, or you would just simply pick Wizard spells that were defensive buffs like Blur and stuff like that and Haste that, you know, you didn't need high intelligence to use, and you could use Wisdom for extra armor class if you're unarmored, and if you wanted to go something like Way of the Four Elements to have even more spells and make those offensive spells more effective, you could do that. So at 10 Monk and 2 Wizard, you gain Wizard Level 1 Spells and Slots. You gain Arcane Recovery, allowing you to recover one of those Spell Slots uh, once per long rest. You're going to pick a Wizard Subclass and get a feature from that, which is quite nice, in exchange for losing a feat and a Subclass feature. And this is probably a wash, in my opinion. Again, if you don't go deeper into Wizard, I don't see the point in just multi-classing for a couple levels. So you're probably going to want to go more levels into Wizard if you want to multi-class with Wizard. So if you go 9 Monk and 3 Wizard, you gain Wizard level 2 spells and slots. You gain another Arcane Recovery Charge, which helps you regain a level 1 spell slot or a level 2 spell slot. And you lose Improved Unarmored Movement and Purity of Body. This is a good trade in my opinion. I would at least go 9 and 3 if you're going to go Monk Wizard. And at 8 Monk, 4 Wizard, you're going to gain a Cantrip and a Feat in exchange for losing Advanced Unarmored Movement and some Unarmed Damage. If you're playing Unarmed, this is probably... You know, you're either going to want to go down much lower, like 6 and 6 or something like that, or you probably want to stop at 9 and 3, but if you're playing with a weapon, this is probably a fair trade. At 7 Monk and 5 Wizard, you're going to gain access to level 3 spells and spell slots. You're going to gain another Arcane Recovery Charge, and you'll lose a feat. This is a great trade, in my opinion, and if I was going to play a Monk Wizard, I'd either go Monk, 3 Wizard, 9 Monk, dip a little bit in to gain some, you know, utility spells that I could use to protect my, like, melee-focused Monk, or I would go more, you know, the 7 and 5 route and really, like, really lean into spell casting when I want it and then be meleeing the rest of the time. So I think this is a good trade. And then at 6 Monk and 6 Wizard, you're going to gain another Wizard subclass feature in exchange for losing Evasion and Stillness of Mind. The Wizard subclass features at level 6 vary a lot from subclass to subclass, but some of them are quite good, particularly like Evocation, um, particularly like Necromancy. So if you're playing, you know, some depending on what spell casting class, Divination also has a good one. Um, you might want to go 6 and 6, and that'll also give you another spell slot for Wizard, which is great. And you still have, like, the good subclass features of 6 levels of Monk. So I think 6 and 6, 7 and 5, either of these are acceptable depending on what that subclass feature you're gaining is. So that wraps up our video on Monk multiclassing. I know you guys have been waiting a while for this one. I hope it helps you make some decisions about what you want to multiclass. Don't be afraid to multiclass Monk. Even though it uses Wisdom for its spells compared to some other spell casting classes, you really don't need a lot of Wisdom on a Monk. You could take their spell casting or you could pick some spells that don't really need you know intelligence or charisma you know and just focus on the wisdom instead and pick some defensive spells there are a lot of ways you can multi-class monk with spellcasters so don't be afraid to multi-class monk with them and really get into it and enjoy it